the lifestyle, like all of that, you know. Um, but she always told me, you know, get your own. Anything a man give you is icing on the cake. Always get your own. Anything a man give you is just extra icing on the cake. She always instilled and said that to me, you know. So you believe your mom taught you to hustle, basically? Of course. What? My mother was the best booster in my town. Like, everybody shot with my mother. Ask about her. So, you know, I lived it, but I also came home from school one day, and the feds was sitting outside our house coming to subpoena my mother. Okay, so I seen us have it, and I seen all of it go. started we have the one and only yes sorry if i messed up the mic man we have the one and only yaz anderson from bridgeport Connecticut. now let me stop yaz anderson from now atlanta georgia welcome yaz thank you known as yes to yes oh my. you got you already got to get started with the branding already <laughs> we're just getting started yaz <laughs> So for those that don't know you, give a small little description about you, then I'm going to get into the other parts. So who is Yaz Anderson? So Yaz Anderson is a boss lady from Bridgeport, Connecticut, um, who moved to Atlanta at a very young age with no guidance, um, you know, just going there to kind of do what everybody else was doing, what they said to do. Hustle. Hustle, go to college, get a job. Try that, and um, lo and behold, that didn't work for me, Beethoven. <laughs> and you went other way. So I, let, let's go. So let's go. I want to start from the beginning, though. So Yaz Anderson from Bridgeport, Connecticut. Growing up and born and raised in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Definitely, no doubt. Born and raised in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Mom and dad. Single mother. Single mother of three girls. I'm the middle daughter of three. You know. Three girls in the house. Three girls in the house, and I'm the middle child. Ooh, all the pressure in the world. Is on the middle child. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that one Yeah, I could only imagine what the other ones went through with you. Because you're not the first child. Mm -hmm. You know, the first child, oh, so excited. The youngest child, spoil rot, and think they run the family. And, and that middle you? child is just you. It's just, it's just <laughs> you. So, how, how, how was it growing up in the house of... You know, with four women in the house, that had to be a little intense. Uh, it it was a little bit, not too much. You know, my mother wasn't around a lot of times growing up in the house. Um, you know, my mother come from the street, so she was out a lot of times. So that left us to be on our own. You What's know? the age difference? What's the age? What's the We're age? We're all gap? about six years apart. Okay. Yeah, all of us are about six years apart. So mom is out running the street doing her thing. So what we do, we out really? in the street too doing, doing our, our thing. thing. <laughs> so what the, where did you go to school? So you went to, you live in the East End, North, like which area? So I lived on the East End. Okay. Shout out to the East End of oh, Bridgeport, God. Newfield. <laughs> Please, yes. <laughs> so embarrassing. So I... <laughs> I lived on the East End, but my grandmother on my dad's side mm -hmm. lived on the nicer side of town on the North End. So I was able to use my grandmother's address so that I could go to school. school on the North End. So you went the you, Central. So you went to Central. Yes, but growing I graduated up in, from Central. But what is that lifestyle like for those that don't know growing up in Bridgeport, Connecticut in the East End? Middle school, high school, like how? What was that lifestyle like in, in the community of Bridgeport, Connecticut? <laughs> I know it well because I'm from Bridgeport, Connecticut. But what does that look like? Well, you got to understand too. I left at a young age. I left right after high school. But before then, but I want before wanted... then, you know it. It was rough. Like you were pretty much finding your own way through life. You know, it's really no one there to to guide you or show you how to get through this journey called life. So. You know, um, it was a community that was heavily infested with drugs. 
you know, things like that, gun violence, um, you know, so it wasn't, it, it it was not good, you know, and then it was freezing cold. <laughs> That's why I left. I couldn't stand the freezing cold. I can remember being in, you know, middle school and high school at the bus stop, and the freezing cold, my ears is just frozen. You wasn't for that. I, I was not for that at all, you know, so... Um, my mom sent me away to get me away from the elements, you mm. know, of where I'm from. That's how I got to Atlanta. She, I was supposed to go to Sacred Heart University. I was accepted to Sacred Heart in Connecticut. But how, why? Why did? Why was college an option for you? Like what? Like why did you guys growing up in the atmosphere you grew up in? Why was college important for you guys? For you? Well. Still to this day, I'm the first one in my immediate family to graduate high school, the first one to get a college degree, you oh, know, so thank you. Um, that that was all the information or the resources, I guess, that my parents had. So they told me that's what I was supposed to do. Go to school. Was to, you're going to go to college, you know, like we're going to get you out of here and you're going to go to college. So why she sent me is because she found out that um, her daughter was seeing a grown man, okay? I had a boyfriend that was some years older than me, and she, you know, did everything in her power to, you know, break that relationship up. So, so going to school was going to be that strategy. That was, it was really kind of like the strategy or the punishment to get me away from him, if you will. So she, um, the papers came, and I got accepted to Morris Brown College in Atlanta, and she was like, oh, no, you going to Georgia. Perfect. She, yeah, perfect. She found out. And, um, you know, she sent me away. So but I want to I want to talk about the Anderson, your family growing up in Bridgeport, because you have somebody that's close, that's dear to me with the same birthday. Our birthday's <laughs> coming up. Um, Brooke, um, which is your first cousin. First cousin. You got. That's the Anderson side of the family. Yes. That's your father's side. That's my dad's That's side. Fa- yes. Like, speak a little bit about your family growing up in Bridgeport. Like, was your mom's side a, a big family also, and your dad's side was a big family? So, my dad's side is definitely a bigger side than my mom's side. Like, I never even knew my mom's mother, my grandmother on my mom's side. My mother lost her mother when she was 16. Wow. Yeah. Um. You know, and she struggled, you know, um with drugs and things like that, you know, from the time she was 16, you know, she just dealing with that hardship, dealing with that hardship and doing the best she could, you know, raising us. But it was always just my mother and her kids, you know, now me and my sisters don't have the same father. So um, on my side and my dad's side is where I had more of, you know, a big family, a little bit more structure. My dad's parents are still together today. Wow, your yeah. grandparents are still. Yes, I do. I know. Yeah, I, I do they're know still that. together today. They they played a a very um effective role. They were heavily in my life coming up. You know, as a child in Connecticut, like I said, because my mother was having those challenges. You know, um, being incarcerated. Uh, my mother's rap sheet is pretty long. So you so growing up in that atmosphere, do you believe that's where the ambition, the hustle, started from? Oh, no, most definitely, no doubt. You know, and I did live in Atlanta once before when I was a child. My mother, um, significant other, you know, she was dealing with a dealer, you know, the biggest one in our neighborhood. And he actually moved us to Georgia. So I had a taste. How old were you thinking around that? I was in, um, shoot, I was in like. Fifth, sixth, seventh grade, because I came back and went to high school in Connecticut. So you knew what time it was at that. So age. I kind of knew what time it was. So you know, he moved us away. We were in this beautiful home built from the ground up. My mom had the minks. She had the cars. The lifestyle was like there. the lifestyle, like all of that, you know. Um, but she always told me, you know, get your own. Anything a man give you is icing on the cake. Always get your own. Anything a man give you is just extra icing on the cake. She always instilled and said that to me. You know? So you believe your mom taught you to hustle, basically? Of course. What? My mother was the best booster in my town. Like, everybody shot with my mother. Ask about her. So, you know, 
I lived it, but I also came home from school one day and the feds was sitting outside our house coming to subpoena my mother. Okay, so I seen us have it and I seen all of it go. How old were you then? Probably about 12. I probably was about 12. So give me that. Give me that. How did it? Like, give me that. I was coming home from school. Um, You know, I was in Ellenwood, Georgia at the time. You know, back then, Ellenwood, Georgia was like the happening place for blacks to live. So that's, you know, where we moved to. And um, I was coming home up the hill, got off the school bus. And there was this car sitting there with these two white men in it. I called my mother. And I let her know. And that's who the two white men were. The feds. The feds. <laughs> what did that change in the house? So it changed everything because now my mom has to pack up her and her kids and go right back where we came from. Well, give me what that looked like. when you, So you left Georgia. Now you guys going back to Connecticut, Bridgeport. Back to our old life. Yeah. You know, and it was a cycle. It was a cycle that was constantly repeated. She relapsed again, you know. Hardship again. Hardship again. Um, by this time, my two sisters are now starting to have my nieces and nephews, their children. You know, my youngest sister with pregnancies and things like that. So life began to happen. You know How old were you thinking you were then? I was, like I said, about about 13 about 13 because I came back and I went to high school back home in Connecticut 9 through 12 and then left again in 93 and never went back. So grow so high school in Central um going to high school in Central in Bridgeport Connecticut. You know how cuz I I know but the people that I don't know what does that experience um what does high school look like for you for Yaz? Man, I had so much fun in high school. Like, I still have a lot of my same friends from my high school. Mm -hmm. You know, um, one of, you know, one of I speak very highly and fond of. Every time I get to go home, I spend time with her. Um, But it was fun. Like, it's nothing like what I see these kids in school now. It's not the same. Did you guys, did you do any sport or just the community overall? Just the community overall, you know, the connections, the relationships. Um, a lot of my friends' parents were actually friends with my parents. So we kind, we real close. I call them my cousins more than my friends. Because you guys were so close. Because we were so close. You know, but we had fun, you know, um... We skipped school. You know, I remember when I first learned how to drive, driving my own whip to school in high school. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a normal thing, guys, but we're going to just go with like it's but regular. But it was fun. I mean, you know, it was fun. For so, us. so, so after that, you decided, um, how were you getting even by? Man, I want to go back. I want to stay in Bridgeport. How were you getting by in Bridgeport at that time? Because I guarantee you, you was already excited about material things. My boyfriend. In so you had an older boyfriend. I had an early. older drug dealer boyfriend. That it says a lot. Give me a little bit more. <laughs> that says a lot, but I want to unpack that a little bit, yeah. So my drug dealer boyfriend, you know, um, he was a dealer, you know. I I would see him hustle. Hustle, you know. So you he was out, he's already out of high school. He, how much older was he? That's the real question. Because it's he was old enough, okay? Too old to be with me. How was dating? How was it dating um, the oldest drug dealer boyfriend ever? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, at that time, you know, to me, it was cool. It was everything. It was everything. You know, I had a, a beautiful truck, you know, on rims. I always had money. Like, I always had food. <laughs> <laughs> I always had food. <laughs> That was important in high that school. That was important in high school. Like, you need money to eat with and stuff like that. <laughs> so, you know, it was important for me because I was able... You want, You said you want to know how I made it through? Absolutely. That's how I made it through. Yeah, your drug dealer boyfriend. My drug dealer boyfriend. Okay. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. And my mother actually kicked me out of the house because of him. You know, and in that, at the time... It, you you don't see no wrong, but now as a mother, you're like, oh my god, how could you? 
How could you? Like, man? soon as she kicked me out, I went and stayed with my aunt, your best friend, mama. Okay, mm. I probably was there for a week, if that. Like, he was the dealer. He knew everybody. He called some real estate lady he knew at the time. He put me in the apartment. So you were at... Wait, wait, so wait. I was in high school in my own apartment. Because my mother kicked me out. So you had to figure out a way. Yes. I, I would never kick my child out. I don't care what she does. I'll never send my child out on the street. I don't care. No. But, once again, your mom wasn't in a stable position... And she had a, a daughter that was probably moving faster than she was. I was moving probably a little too fast. I mean, we had a place to live. We lived on Section 8. You know, we always mm -hmm. lived on Section 8. So we had a place to live. But, but for me, that I don't just want a place to live. You know, I always wanted nice things, you know? Why? How? Like, what, and I, I believe it's from the experience I went through when I was younger. You know, with the situation with her, with my mom, and seeing that lifestyle. Like, I don't open the door before when I wasn't supposed to and seeing things. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so in my mind, that's how you make it. So you thought the streets was your first, that was your first option. Right. Because then you dated a drug dealer boyfriend. So it was like, yeah, it made all the sense in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so, so your mom sends you off to school. Um, how was it leaving your drug dealer boyfriend going out to school? Was he for it? Was or you guys were still together then? Or he moved to Georgia. Wait a minute. So your drug dealer boyfriend, because you're going to school, he decided he was moving also. Or yeah, this, yikes. I don't know if you want to go into all of that. Let's go. You sure this, you this want is, to go this into is that? This is hustler's testimony. Okay, people this is a really, hustler's testimony. People that so, really been through some things. Okay, so I'm I'm the little young tenderoni high school girlfriend, Brenda daughter. He's messing with. Okay, mm -hmm. he also had a family that he was building a house for and moving to Georgia. While his so high school, all girlfriend. she, all my mother did was. Send me right to him, like. Oh. Yeah. So while you going to while your mom thinking that she strategize to get you out of here, I'm all. He already down here. He already got a whole. He family already in down here, and we already hooking up down here too. <laughs> so if it was just perfect for you, exactly. And the family member she sent me to to stay with down here, eventually found out. And told, and then my mother found that out too. That the guy, that the guy is, is down <laughs> here again. <laughs> so after you, after the whole family moved in, moved down, um, your drug dealer boyfriend and his family, and you, it's a nice unit, um, <laughs> super uncomfortable. But Very uncomfortable. <laughs> after you guys move in, so you're in school at Morris Brown then. Correct. Morris Brown. How was that experience? Coming oh, from Bridgeport. Man. It was a culture shock. I mean, to see so many young, beautiful black people. I mean, it was amazing. Like, I was on campus with Kenny Burns. And, like, mm. this is the year the AUC was popping. I'm talking about 93, 94, 95, 96. Okay. So, it was amazing. You know, I'm I'm partying. I'm going to clubs. I'm I'm grown. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, as you were grown, um, before you went yes, to college. Yes, I'm on I my own. I remind you, <laughs> you had an apartment and you were living. We at the warehouse. I'm hanging out, me and Tupac. Like what? So, Atlanta fresh, was the mecca of entertainment, basically. Back, especially during that time, it was crazy at the AU Center. What was the? What, <laughs> I could only imagine. Yo. So, <laughs> but how was school then? Was that even a... So school, remember, you know, this is what Get the information... To the mic, please, this, is, this is what the information is that my mother had. You know, what she knew was to send me to school. You know, so that's what I did because she told me I'm supposed to go to school and get a job so that I could have a successful life. That was her... That, that's, that, was that was her... her. That's all she knew. You know, she didn't finish school. You know what I'm saying? She 
was told and thought that that's the way. She wanted that for me. So I did that for her. You understand me? And I, I learned that later in life that I was doing something for her, for my mother. I was living her dream. I was, you know, going to college because she said I need to go to college and be a nurse. Okay? So it was never your passion or anything? You didn't even want to go to school? I mean, I I guess I did because that's what society tells me I'm supposed to do. But it wasn't something that was in me that, that was my passion. I want to go to school and be a nurse. No. It's because that's what my mother said. You know, remember, I'm looking for guidance, you know, support. You know, that was the main thing I've been looking for all my life a blueprint. Is, is guidance, a blueprint. OK, so she told me to do that. So I did that. It did not work for me. OK, So first year you're in school. How so was the that? first year I was in school? It was a party. It was it, it was fun. Freedom. Freedom. By the second year, you know, you start trying to take it a little bit more serious. But then that's when my school started having issues, you know, with their accreditation and all of that. And when Speak they about lost that. it. Like how so it it yo, it crushed my life, man. Like this is what I didn't I was told to do. I done went through all of this stuff, made out of Connecticut. I'm here. And now they're telling me my school lost the nursing program. I was supposed to be in a dual degree nursing program with Vanderbilt and Morris Brown College. Okay. They lost the pro program. So by year three, that's dead. So that's dead. So the effect of that, do you think it affect a lot of people? What that's, you say? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it's everything that people tell you it is, it's not, you know. So I always wonder what would have happened if I stayed in Connecticut and went to Sacred Heart. I do. I really do. You know, but, um, one thing led to another. Now I'm down here in Atlanta, Georgia on my own. Here I am again. I got to survive. I got to eat. So I got to have so food. So junior year, school So school is, school is dead. That's over with. By now, it's like, okay, girlfriend, you need a job. It's not even normal to you. So uh, where's the drug dealer boyfriend now? Child, gone about his business. Okay. So now it's just you. Now it's just me. Okay. So I get down here. Now I need a job. Luckily, I had a skill that I learned in Connecticut in a program I was in right after high school before I moved to Atlanta, the phlebotomy program. So I learned how to be a phlebotomist. Wow. Took that test, and I actually did that for 19 years. That is my career job. You know, I drew blood in a laboratory and did other laboratory stuff, you know, for about 19 years. So I ended up getting a job in the lab. You know, I had multiple jobs. I was a flight attendant. I worked at the Georgia Dome. You know, I'm just in the land. But I want to know, because I know a little bit about you. <laughs> no, nah, we're not doing this. We're not going to talk about your phlebotomist job. You also <clears throat> been through real things. Like, I I, I think for... So another... I, I think I know what you're reaching for. You're reaching for that next transition that occurred in my life. You're Absolutely. You're talking about when I moved to L.A. Okay. So you, you went from Atlanta right. and then you... Right. Atlanta was, you know, it was drying up for me. You know? This is what, you're already like two, three years out of college now? Like Yes, this is like 2000. It's like 2000. This is about year 2000. Mm -hmm. Okay. So around 2000, I'm like, okay, this ain't it. Okay. What was it? Like 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what happened. So I was working at an office, a doctor's office as a phlebotomist. You know, I'm just working, doing that, just working, nothing, nothing major, real ordinary. Working, coming home, working, coming home, working, coming home, working, coming home. So a friend of mine, you know, a male friend who I was just cool with, Male friend, we kicking it, whatever, going to events, hanging out sometime with him after work. One thing leads to another. Now he decides he wants to date me. That's what he just decided. He decided yeah. one day he wanted right. to date me, and, and I fell for that. Okay. So um, we began seeing one another, right? I can't believe you just made it his fault. 
Yeah, because it was his fault. Because we right. was cool. He we didn't have to go there. He right. didn't have to go there. And and you didn't have to accept the application. <laughs> so, I don't know where we're going with it. We cool, whatever. We kicking it. I'm working. He's working. Um, At the time, I had just finished an interview with a major airline carrier, right? Because I was a flight attendant, I told you before. But I was only domestic. So I wanted to transfer and go with another carrier so I could fly international because that's where the money was with the longer trips. So I got the interview with this airline. They hired me. I was so excited. I picked the three cities. They had me pick three top cities I wanted to go to because you was not going to be based in Atlanta. I think I picked New York because I we close to Connecticut. I could live, you know, with family or somebody in Connecticut and commute. I picked Florida because, of course, I love the beach. And I think the third place I had picked was like Texas, and that's like where their hub was. So my training class was due to start that September. Okay. So September 11th happened in what, 01? Mm-hmm. September 11th occurred. I remember I was at work on Glen Rouge and Dunwoody in the lab when it happened. Still working as a phlebotomist at that company who happens to have offices in California, right? Because I was going to try to transfer that, but they didn't off, They didn't accept my transfer. So I was going to have to go out there with nothing. Be- what made you pick Cali? I'm getting to that. So 9-11 happened. The airline sends me this letter. They cancel my training class. So that's like the third punch in the face here we are again another transition for me like and this is where a, this is a major transition for me right now in life okay this one choice this one decision i made shifted my life so much okay that same dude okay his employer transferred him to california won't you come with me not the new guy that forced you to date him <laughs> <laughs> the new guy that forced you to date him was like, come with me to California. Man, that man got me to L.A. and was whooping my ass. You understand me? Yes. Yes. Serious, serious domestic abuse situation went on. Okay. So I had to get out of that. But I felt so bad. I felt like a, another failure. You know, here I am, something again, another failure. I can't call home. You know, they kept, they told me not to move out here. They told me not to do it. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, shoot, move to LA. Cool. You got the job. They're going to get, hook us up with a place. But I didn't have anything. I didn't have any income, any resources, nothing. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go out here and pursue what? Entertainment. I want to act. So did, did you have that ambition before? Or you just always, put- always. So that's why I jumped on the opportunity, I think, so fast. That's why I, I, I didn't really, Think about it. You know what I'm saying? And it went really well. Like I I actually did a few, a few things, you know, I did um, several music videos, uh, several of the very first reality shows, Um, the fifth wheel. I was on that for several seasons. Um, Just a lot of different stuff. You know, I was an extra. I mean, I got sag roles too. I was a stand in for Monique. Uh, I worked with uh, Kevin Hart and Snoop on that one. Uh, that what's that bootleg bootleg film they got out? The <laughs> I'm thinking of Soul Plane, but Soul Plane. Oh my god! If I ever watch Soul Yo, Plane, I see if you, you don't it. watch that, I me and Brooke is love... all in that. Like you, I'm I surprised you ain't check. never seen it. So it's... you know now, I need to go back and watch. Oh, you Soul Plane. definitely gotta watch that. You Absolutely. definitely got to watch that. So Old boy tonight. from New York that did that film. Yeah, we we had so much fun on that set. Like Kevin Hart was just getting started. Snoop. I mean, we had a blast. So I did a little of this, little of that. I was on Doggy Fizzle, you know. So it was fun and it was exciting. But. You were getting abused. I was getting abused because someone was getting very jealous. Yeah. So I was like, I got to get out of this, you know? So when he beat my ass and threw me out the house in the middle of December, butt naked, I knew then I got to go. I'm going to have to just bite the bullet and cry and call for help, you know? 
So that, that's how you survive that by calling back home? And- no, I didn't. So what I did, I called a friend back home in Atlanta, and he was like, um, you know, hook up. Hook up with my other homegirls. You know, they from Atlanta. They out there too. whoop de whoop 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 So I hook up with these other females that was from Atlanta too that we had a mutual friend. So survival I start, mode. Survival mode. So now I'm staying with them. Like I'm going from house to house basically now. You know, like. And that's when the incident happened. I, I got approached to do the run. And that's when I did the run. What's the run? The felony. <laughs> yeah. So I needed money. So I was propositioned. You know, if you drive this here, I'm going to pay you this. All I was thinking about was the money. Because you're surviving. Correct. All I wanted to do was get back to Georgia. I was like, okay, if I do this run, then I could come back, get my stuff. What type of back. money you talking about with this run? So... And then I find out later that 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 ain't even what it costs. Like, and they cheated. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you really got mad at. Treated you too. And they cheated me. Five thousand dollars. A hundred and sixty of them things. Five hundred dollars. I mean, five thousand dollars. Wait, 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 wait. So I'm trying to do the math, and I'm trying to understand. And it was two of us in the car. So you guys had to get a hundred. How many? How many? Sixty. 160 of them things we gonna call it <laughs> those things for only 5,000 oh you guys were the best price in the market everybody yo would, the, everybody the would popo you like, was even laughing at my dumb ass <laughs> <laughs> I'm not supposed to laugh at this you guys so how old were you then yet? let me see this was in 03 when I caught the case so I was about it's in the newspapers. I made the papers. Look you it up. The, I was 28. I was 28. It happened in Georgia. I got all the way to Georgia and got caught in Carroll County. Wait a minute. So you guys were driving 160 of those things from California to, to Georgia. Georgia. And we got all the way to, to Carrollton. Georgia. And that's when we got caught. Wow. So carry on. So, you know... <laughs> This is where shit gets real. Like, you know, we having fun having this conversation, but really, but right, right here is where it really got real for me. All jokes aside, because now we talking fed time. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay, your dumb ass done went and got in the car with this stuff. Trying to get home. You already don't have nothing. It was just me and my dog. Literally. Okay. So they pull us over. We get down to the place. You know, they questioning you, everything. You know me. Um, I know nothing. <laughs> Look, well, can you call them, see if they could come and meet you right here? Da, 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 call them, let me see if they... Okay. You know, I'm already calling, giving them the code. Don't come. You understand what I'm saying? Real, real talk. So they asking me, it's okay? You know? It was like, I kind of figured that when I lost touch with you and it been so long, blah, 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 blah. Because now they're trying to get me to sure. set them up. You understand what I'm saying? So, mind you, I still had my house in Georgia because I rented that out to move to L.A., right? But the tenants I had wasn't paying. They was tearing the place up. I really needed to get back to Georgia Cause I had a place to live in Georgia. Wait, you Georgia. bought a house in Georgia? I bought my first house when I was twenty four years old. Oh wow! Yeah, I bought. I, come on now, making that little salary at that job in the lab, definitely. So I was just trying to get back. I was like, if I could just get back to Georgia. So I'm telling him, you know, to meet me at that address at my spot. But in, at the same time, I'm telling him. Don't, but don't really come. So these people got us sitting at the house. We sitting there for about two more hours. Finally, they like, it don't look like your people coming, whatever. So they took us on down and baby girl is now charged with a felony. Okay. So I get locked up. I sit in jail for about two weeks. Okay. I lost 
probably about 50, 60 pounds. I'm down to like 100 pounds. Yeah. Um, so I get out and now I got this case hanging over me. So it's like everything went from bad to worse. Where's your family that whole time? Do they know now? <sighs> yeah, I had to call them. Like, yo, my family was devastated. Crushed. I mean, crushed. My grandmother, mm -hmm. uh, my father's side, it got all the way to my grandmother. The story was all messed up, all wrong. They said I was in the airport trying to bring keys through the airport and all this old crazy stuff. Like, it it put a stain on me and my family. Even now, I think, I think even still to this day, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I used to be very, very, very ashamed of it. And it's, it's, it's just crazy how I could sit here and talk to you about it now absolutely. so openly because I was very, very embarrassed about this. What was the biggest embarrassment? Like, what was the embarrassment? Was it just the overall the thing? The overall just... that I, that I, that I tried to, one, try to do something so stupid, you know, and it didn't work. And two, now here I am really with nothing. Like, I'm talking really starting over with nothing because all my stuff was back in L.A. My car, everything. I'm in a rental. You know, got my dog in the car on the ride with me. The people took my dog. I'm calling my mother's friends. Everybody, somebody, please just go get my pet before they put my pet down. You understand? What I'm, like, it was crazy. And that whole thing, you by yourself dealing with this whole thing right the now. The whole thing by myself. So, you know, I go for the little court thing or whatever. They read your charges, you know, the arraignment or whatever. And I'm I'm charged with, with a felony, trafficking, you know? Those two weeks being locked up, what was it like for you? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Man. <sighs> to sit in jail two weeks. <laughs> I know people have been in jail a long, lot longer than that, but two weeks felt like a lifetime for me in there. I mean, I, I didn't eat for two weeks. That's how I lost so much weight. Like, I, I couldn't eat what they were serving. You know, it was one TV in the room. We could go in there and go watch TV. You know, we could braid each other hair, whatever. Or, you know, telling each other these life stories and stuff. Like, what what can you do? You, you locked up. Did you have any... Uh, did you feel you wasn't going to get out? I never felt I wasn't going to get out. I don't know what it is, but it's always been something inside of me that knows and understands that these are just hurdles. I always believe in something bigger than me. I'm talking about as far as I could remember. And I didn't grow up in a church home, church family. My mother didn't teach me about church, God, none of that stuff. You know, I was convicted at a very late age in life. But I always felt and understood like it, it got to be something else. This cannot be it for me. It was ne nothing was never enough to just knock me off my game permanently. Nothing. You know, and I've been through a lot. I'm just giving you a little bit today. But so, listen. So then what happens after that? Please. So I sat in there, you know, and um, I got out. I made bond. And... um. I got this case now. I need a lawyer. <laughs> I have a felony charge, you know? So I had to get money. So another one of my girlfriends, um, she was from New York, who I was used to hang out with a lot at the time. She was dancing. You know, this is back when, you know, that was a popular thing. Mm -hmm. Okay? and Dancing um, in Atlanta. In Atlanta. She's like, um... She's like, what you gonna do? You gotta get this money, you know what I'm saying? And she told me about the club she was at. Next thing I know, I go with her to the club. They they brought me in a room, told me, take your clothes off, spin around, turn around, look at me. <laughs> and it's You gotta get the money. They're going out there. <laughs> Wait, that was your interview in your hire? No, that was the interview. 
interview. <laughs> Wait. So, so that was the interview. You got to get hired get- right after. <laughs> So they was like, okay. I'm like, all right. So now I need the stuff for that. You need the outfits. You need the shoes. That again. shit costs money. <laughs> Here we go again. I don't have the money. I'm like, man, this road is a winding road to success, boy. I'm telling you, it's like, if it ain't one thing, it's another. So I'm calling around trying to find out who the best drug attorney is in this town. <laughs> So, you know, I had, you know, I've been back a little bit. So I had been outside a little bit. So I had met a few people in Atlanta, kind of, you know, in the industry, music industry, things like that. And they referred an attorney to me. So I called this lawyer, went down to see him. All by yourself at this time. Yo, I ain't never felt so alone in my life than I did at this point. Like, <sighs> they told me. Just think, just playing it back in my head, just bring back, be like, what was I thinking? Like, survival. Yeah. Yeah. Saw so this lawyer, he's like, okay, 15 racks. I'm like, okay, where am I to get $15,000 from just like that? So, and that's how my adult, interview. my adult entertainment <laughs> life came about. I got to get this money. So not only am I hustling in the club, making money every day to, to break him off. Mind you, my townhouse that I told you that I bought when I was 24, that the tenants I had in there that trashed it and did everything to it, ain't no utilities on there. I'm on the floor in there. I'm t- like nothing. I'm on the floor. So I'm grinding i'm grinding i gotta pay to get the floors redone to put in i gotta get somebody to come and paint so okay this week i'm gonna do pay for the painters this week's gonna be the floor this week is gonna be the cabinets okay i need a bed mattress on the gotta get off the floor like it really was real for me at that time like all jokes aside it was the worst time of my life okay so I get through that, get the place, you know, up to par, you know. Still paying attorney. Still paying attorney, get the lawyer paid. We going back and forth to court, you know, back and forth to court, back and forth to court, back and forth to court. And when I tell you we got caught in the wrong town, first of all, okay? Wrong, wrong town, number one. Then the amount, you know they got to make an example out of me, right? Back and forth. The Sorry, one second. You also was with another girl in the case. Correct. It was two of us in the car. Okay. So, long story short, we going back and forth the court, back and forth the court. Finally, it comes down to it. Like, this, this is the last appearance. My lawyer comes and he's like, look, this is what it is. This is the best I can get you. And you know what that was? Ten years. Ten years fed time. 10 years so you had to sit for 10 years this is where it get good it might have been the worst time of my life but I'm going to tell you right now this is when it gets really really good okay so you know by now I'm telling my mother because she's up in Connecticut you know mine's looking like I, I got to go sit down like I really was preparing myself to accept this mm. Like, real talk. I'm, like, because I'm a strong person. I've always been a strong person. I mean, even when I was younger, I've always been a strong person and can deal with just about anything. Some people, they they don't understand how I deal with some stuff. They be like, especially things that I know that I can't control, I learned to not let those things weigh me down if I can't control them. You think that's from previous experience, oh, your no traumas? Doubt. Definitely. Definitely, definitely. So I was like, I gotta just go and take these 10. You know, so the lawyer's like, you gonna we gonna just accept these 10. So they give me the date for the sentencing. 
Okay. Remember the girl that was with me in the car, she's from Cali. I'm from LA. I mean, from Atlanta. They let me out before they let her out because I had a Georgia ID. Okay. So I was able to get out and still kind of make moves, make calls and do what I can to assist her to get her out. So here we are. Mom, you got to come down. I'm calling my mother now. She got to come down on that date because that's the day I go to court to go to prison. So my mom flies in. She's going to stay now and keep my house and keep my car and just just maintain it, keep it going until I get back. And it's like, yo, The ride down the do you know what it feels like to ride down the highway to know you're going to 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 mm. court to to give yourself up for ten years? Mm. Do you have any idea what that feels like? Yes, um. <laughs> it's not good, right? Yeah, not good. So, you know, I got all my crying out, my tears. You know, I, you know, but you know me, I'm like, this is what it is. About to eat it. I got to eat it. I got to eat it. This is my dumb ass. This is what I did. I got to pay for it. I have to learn something from this, obviously. When I tell you the people had us at that, had us at court all day, it seemed like they had so many cases. I'm like, yo, when are they going to get to us? You know, he keep coming in and out, in and out, in and out. Then he come out to me again. He come in and out, in and out, in and out. Is he negotiating at this point? I don't know what he doing. They, they doing something. They had to be talking about something, okay? Because my ass walked out of there that day, and I was back on that 20 going the other way, okay? Can't nobody tell me God is not real. So you, you supposed they, to be- They turned it from 10 years served to 10 years probation. Do you know what that feels like? What that ride felt like I going back home? home. <laughs> now that ride seems a little different. A whole lot. I'm talking about. I couldn't call people fast enough. Okay, let me call mommy now. I, let me call. I, now, let me I call so and so. Let me call. Like that. Yes. Very similar. I got yes. an AR. Go home. It was like first of. Yeah. I was like this. I could, Oh my God! You talking about relief? A whole ride. Thank you, Jesus. He is real. <laughs> all of a sudden, now you can pray. Now you know all the prayers at that point. Yes. So what? It, this is what it was, though. My co-defendant was pregnant, and her lawyer, I guess, you know, was arguing the that case, and the judge that we had that day. Was not trying to send her to jail pregnant. So now they you do all that shit. Open. Now they don't care. My lawyer, I guess that's what they was going back and forth. What was like? No, they co defendants. Whatever this one get, this one got to get. You caught a blessing. What? Now is where the work really begins. Because now I'm like, okay, I got out of this. The now biggest. what? The biggest. Still no money. <laughs> <laughs> back to school. All you wanted was a ride back to Georgia. <laughs> I could have hitchhiked for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could have picked you up. <laughs> somebody would have. I didn't. I wasn't thinking. Somebody could have picked somebody, you up. I, I was too embarrassed. I felt like a failure. Yeah, but 10 years in prison, a ride, I need $1,000. The whole family would have put up $20 at that to point. To get me home. So what What could you tell somebody that's literally going through something like that? Is it swallowing your pride? Like Definitely. Like, get to the mic. Get back it's, to the mic. It's, it's definitely swallowing your pride, guys, for real. I mean, you cannot make impulse decisions like that out of despair. You cannot do that. Because it will affect you in many ways, way down the road. Okay? Because now here I am, a successful real estate professional, because I couldn't get a real estate license because of my felony. That's how I got into real estate investing. 
Okay, because <laughs> while I was dancing and stripping, one night I got so drunk I fell and broke my ankle. Okay. You can't make this up. I yes. promise you, you can't make this up. I told you I need a book. <laughs> so two I, about two books. About two books. So I broke my ankle, right? Wait, so I wait, can't strip you, with you, <laughs> crutches. <laughs> So were you one of those clumsy strippers? Because how you break your... I broke my tibula. No insurance. I'm a stripper. No insurance. Leg broke. I'm talking about like... It, I said, yo. <laughs> <laughs> you next level, yeah. So... Wait, all I want to know is, did you try to go back to the strip club with your crushes? That's all I want. I used yes. to go in there and hang out. Not to I'll work, but okay. I would go I in there, have it. a drink, and put my foot right up. <laughs> and all my little friends, all the dancers will come around. You know, I'll come in there with somebody or whatever. We break them off. You know? Yeah. The, you still was hustling. Yeah. <laughs> with the cast, everything. I already know. Okay. So, my friend calls me, and he's like, listen. Because, you know, I let him know. There's a few people that knew what I was dealing with. So, my friend who I do a lot of business with still to this day. He's a mortgage banker. But I wasn't into what I'm into now then. But he's always been in that. Mm. But he's just looking out for me, you know, real recognized, real. He's like, yes, one of my clients who was an investor was looking for an assistant. He had just got rid of his last assistant. He had a big firm in Atlanta. You know, he built... Hundreds of houses, you know, did a lot of developments, luxury stuff, all of that. So I go down there and interview with him. I get the job. So I work with him probably for a few years. And I learned everything I could. It's like I was like a sponge. I was absorbing everything, learning everything I could from him about fixing and flipping properties and real estate investing and cash out refis. Like they were very popular back then, you know. So I start having a, a, a taste of success again. You know, I start making real money, you know, doing with, this. Doing what? With ref like with, with the with working with him as his assistant. Because now I done learned the game. I'm brokering deals with him. You I'm a hustler. You seen it. So I seen it. Oh, you need me to find people with money that want to flip it and make more money? Oh, okay. I got it. So now I'm brokering deals with him. I'm making guap, like, you know? It's like, oh, okay, I like this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That relationship ended, okay? He got rid of me. Here I am at another crossroads. Me being yes and who I am. I went and got me an LLC. And I picked right up from where I left off and started doing the exact same thing. He taught me, but on my own. As far as what the more like the wholesaling properties, wholesaling properties, wholesaling properties. Let's get into that. So once I learned that all I had to do was middleman. Okay, find somebody that wants to buy this from somebody else, and I get a profit in between. This this sounds too much. This sound like the street, right? So with wholesaling, you know it. I go find an off-market property that's not listed on MLS. I negotiate the lowest possible price with the seller or the owner, right? Now I got this investor over here. I got this contract. I got this house. It's worth this. But if you fix it and put this in it, it's going to be worth this. I don't already put my fee on it by the time I gave it to him. I didn't need a real estate license. Once I learned that concept, ding, 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 goes off in my head. So I started, you know, getting into that heavy, like really heavy. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about making, that's your best friend. We killing it, you know, making money, but still not having that financial education and not knowing what to do with not the money. Not understanding money. There you go. So, so you guys, so basically you found out having a felony, I can't get my real estate license. Once the again, board turned me down. Once again, as who you are, your trauma, your hardship, you said, I got to adjust again. 
I got to get it how I live. <laughs> and what that meant was I'm going to find, you found a way to still make money in real estate. Absolutely. That was through wholesaling. Correct. What type of money is in wholesaling? Well, a, let me, me let me just deal. say this. Let me say this. Mm-hmm. Okay, I have an ebook. It's called Seven Steps to Wholesale and Real Estate. Okay. And We're gonna put a link on that on the web on your on your on this show. And I put a lot of the information in there on how to do it. And I actually show the receipts, okay? The HUD settlement statements and copies of the contract and a copy of my most recent check stuff from my last job. Mm. I have done more than once. In one transaction, my entire annual salary from my most recent job in one wholesale deal, multiple times, okay? But again, with no guidance and no real financial literacy where we come from, we like to just look like the money. So I got the money, so I'm wearing the money, so I look like the money. But I'm not really changing anything. You know, I'm not investing. The money's not growing. I'm still just hustling, right? So fast forward to today. Now this is my second company. That company dissolved in 2010 after the market crash. That's when I found it. Yes to Yaz in 2015. Now I'm wiser. Okay. Um, How did you get to that point? So I changed my environment. My environment had, I'm telling y'all, your environment has a lot to do with, you know, which direction you go in life. It is, it just is, you know. So I started getting around people that were doing the things that I wanted to do. You know, I wanted to be an investor myself because here I am. I just found a way to hustle to get them some money. Like I was getting a little bit, but they was getting the real money. Like I done did deals, sold clients deals where they made a quarter million dollars on one deal. Yeah, I've done that. And all I made was like 15,000. So I had to quickly realize it's time to turn this hustle into a legitimate business and treat it as such. So that's what I did. I started developing my skills, um, being part of financial groups, you know, with other financial uh, people who were doing the things that I wanted to do and learning what other investments are out there available for me to now put my money that I'm making because I was just making it and spending it. So now when I make my money, I just dump it all in my private reserve accounts. I currently have like three of those, you know, they're similar to like an IUL. So, so what you did was, so basically, I love this. So you, you were hustling. You went from hustling to building, you still hustling, you still grinding, but now you're building a business out of Definitely, the definitely. That was, that was the biggest thing for me, you know, as I continue to elevate and grow in business and make money in business, I still felt like I'm hustling at heart, you know, because I didn't have the structure. I didn't have the systems and things like that because I was trying to do everything by myself because I could never get good people around me, you know. And we'll talk about that later. Like, it's it's hard to keep good people around that's even on the same plane as you that's not trying to, you know, stab you in the back and steal from you, take your information and things like that. So, you know, here we are again, another turning point, right? So it's time to turn this hustle into a business. And that's that's what I've been doing, you know, here recently, taking it to the next level, doing things like this, putting systems in place, you know, instead of just trying to catch the next deal. So give a, I want you to give a little bit about the real estate system that you have. Mm -hmm. Give a little bit about that. So, you know, when I worked at that firm and I was referring family and friends, not from from just in Georgia, but from all over the country to this investment firm, they started to ask me questions. You know, our people, when they see you, you know, you change and you swagged up, they see in the fruit, they start to ask questions. So, again, here I am, this hustler's mentality, they asking me questions 
oh, yes, this is an opportunity for me to create a business showing people how to do this. And that's what I did. So now what I do is I show people how to fund, find, fix, and flip real estate for maximum profits. What does that profit look like? I want them to know. So, you know... My motto is this. When you say yes to yes, you're saying yes to yourself. Because great, I'm Great gonna, branding also. <laughs> thank you. Because I'm going to put you in a deal where you're going to get a minimum of 100 plus percent return on your initial investment. So, you know, a lot of, of other um, systems and programs and things are like that out here. But they're only guaranteeing the investors like, you know, 50 or 40 percent return on their money well when you do a deal with yes you're going to get a hundred percent return on your money that means you're going to double your money so if i put you in a deal where you need to put down forty thousand expect to get eighty thousand back how and why how how because if you have forty thousand to invest i'm going to go and find you a property that has profit margins in a spread to where you can make eighty thousand dollars so is the is going back to the hustling where you're hustling, looking for these properties to fit the investors. You can call it a hustle, but I mean, it's a legitimate business. No, no. Yeah. Um, let yeah, me, let me be it's, clear. It's, it's a hustle still in a sense, but it is a strategy that has, that you've been successful. That with. I've been, ver- and then anything I've ever done in my life, this is my, my is meat, it? you know? So it is what it is. It's been going on for generations. You know, I think it's like one or two states where wholesaling is is not allowed, where you cannot, you know, do that. Because all it is is me putting a property on contract and selling the contract. I'm not, I don't own a house. I'm not selling a house. I just put this house on contract for one price, and I'm about to sell the contract to you at a markup. It ain't no different than in being in the street where you go get one of them things you put something on it and then you go sell it to somebody else. It's no Strange different. Thing, but what but you have a very unique thing also with your business where you actually help develop the property also? Absolutely. Yeah. Speak so a, a lot of my that. a lot of my clients are not local. And when I say that they're not in Georgia. So my deals are in Georgia where I can be the boots on the ground and really make sure that you are successful in this from beginning to end. So, you know, they need someone there. Speak on that process. What does that process look like? So once so I we, call you, hey, you call me up. I have 50K. I need you to make this work. What happens? <laughs> well, you're not going to just call me and say you got 50K. You're going <laughs> to click a, the link and you're going to book a call with me. Abs- yeah, absolutely. And we're, <laughs> we're going to talk. Thank God I still have your And we're going to tailor a plan for you. That's what profit from property is. It's the exclusivity what my clients like because I'm tailoring a plan for you. It's not a cookie cutter type of thing. Mm, that's a game changer. You understand? So when I work with you, you might have an 850 credit score and 40,000. This person might have, I don't know, a 600 credit score and 60,000. So it's, it just, it's going to be tailored to you. So if you have 50 grand to invest, okay, I know now I got to go out and find a house where he can make his 50 back plus another 50. So that means he, we need to have over a hundred plus thousand dollars spread, not including for the construction. You understand? So say I find a house for a hundred K off market. It's not listed on the MLS. Can no realtor find this for you or anything like that. I negotiated with that seller or the owner for a hundred K. I look at it. I assess it. I know what it costs to do HVAC system, brand new, in a house, you know, the standard size, 15, 13, 14, whatever, 100 square feet, 3, 2. Okay? You know what it needs for HVAC. You know how much it costs for plumbing. I assess the budget. I look at the ARV. The ARV is the after repair value, what we can sell the house for. Okay? So if the house I found is 100, the budget is 50, Okay, the house needs to appraise for at least 350 or higher. So if the comps are not saying that, then that's not the deal that's going to make you double your money. So that's not wouldn't be the one. So you're so, guiding me so through that I'm whole thing. So I'm doing all exactly. And that's where people get mixed up because they don't understand the numbers, you know, and how the numbers work and how much of 
their money they're going to need and how much of the bank's money are they going to put up. So that's where I come in to help you and to make you understand how we're going to do it, how much you can get and how much you're going to need and basically what the property is worth and what we can sell it for. So you're managing the actual business. Mm -hmm. You're managing the construction also. You're managing the whole project. Mm -hmm. So, wow. So 50,000 investment. You find me the right property. You manage the property. You manage the process of the project. Um, Am I selling it, holding it, flipping it, or you... So that depends, you know, on on the investor, you know, when they come in, are they looking to flip to make more money to get more capital or are they looking for something long term? You know, do you need short term money or you want long term? Okay, long term is buy and hold. That's that passive residual income you want. You thinking about the future. So most of those investors have already done a few flips. You know, they they. Capital is where it should be. They're cash strong. Now they want to park some money, you know, and have a few rentals. You know, they got money if things come up. That's why I always tell my clients as your first investment, you know, get you some capital. Do a fix and flip. Unless you're going to do a buy and hold and it's more than one door. But don't do a single family first if you don't have no money. Not as a buy and hold. So very few people will be honest about that that I've met. Yeah, like we'll get calls all day long to buy that one property. Like, for, like say if I was just coming into it, hey, buy this one property, flip it. Now you're stuck with you know. Yeah. So you giving that guidance, giving that support to say, hey, this is a process. This is a strategy. You could do it. So when it comes to, um, like why is real estate so important? Because it's like the number one way to build wealth in our country. You know, I mean. It's it, it's a it's a profitable asset that in most cases continuously gains. It grows in value. You know, if you take care of it properly, you know what I'm saying? Um, pay it off in full. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great investment. Because the, the asset cons consistently grow. Exactly. Exactly. You know, it's not as risky as some of these other investments, you know, a lot of people are into. You know, speak a little bit more about some of the success that you've had in real estate from servicing clients and yourself. So, you know, I'm very, very proud of myself, you know, where I've taken the business now um, with real estate and just the whole financial services as a whole. For two years, I led a financial services ministry at my local church. Right, that's dope. Yeah, it was. Yeah, that's when you started finding God and realized. Yeah. It yeah. kind of worked out now. And it's and it's crazy because I I that was another time where I heavily doubted myself like mm. when I was going for that that role and um I was very surprised when they they gave it to me cuz I I didn't feel like you know they would with someone like me who had such a tarnished you I know think your testimony background. is what, that's the important part. Yeah, so I'm very proud very proud of that um I also have been a part of a financial service networking company where I've led 56 team members on their road to financial success with the company. Powerful. Yeah. So, you know, I'm I'm proud. I'm proud of, you know, where I am. Proud now. of you also. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I think you. Well, give me some success of some of the people that you service, you know, some of the flips, some of the exciting the money talk that people <laughs> want to know about. So, uh, definitely, I can remember one um, lady, she's a military uh, mom and wife. She um, purchased a deal for me and did very, very well. She has a mother who is heavy in real estate, has multiple properties, um, but she didn't want to do it with her mom, she said. She she wanted to do it on her home for herself, and she hired me to help her. And um, she had just had a new baby, you know. And she got her first flip with me. And it was a major success. Uh, her video is is out there somewhere on my website and that her testimony. Um, very happy about that. And then I told you about my other client that profited the quarter million dollars on a flip. That was a mansion flip. Well, what's the success in that? Is it that you find the right find is important, of course? It's, it's the right find. It's definitely 
the right find. You just, I mean, I don't know. You just got to get lucky and get just be blessed like that. You know, I can remember another house on, was it Oakland? I think it's called Oakland, Oakland Drive, 1227 Oakland. Um, you remember that drive? Oh, yeah. Right in the heart of the West End, right by that house where Tyler Perry filmed. Um, what's that movie? Were they all on the front porch? Mm -hmm. So that house there, I was just driving one day, you know, because I like to drive around and find my houses. You know, I get the whole, you know, the, the apps and all of that. But when you're buying lists and, and using apps and stuff and buying lists, how many people done bought that list? You know, so I like to still kind of drive around, knock on doors. They say it's not that safe or whatever, but hey, I'm you, out. You, you've been through some things. Yeah, yeah, you know, so it's not. What yeah, I'm riding about. through the west, and then I see this man. You know, he outside painting the windows on this house. Painting the window. Yeah, so I'm. I stopped because I wanted to ask him, <laughs> "Do you know the owner?" I'm thinking he's painting, doing some work That's for right. the owner. Mm -hmm. He was the owner. So I think I want to, but I want to say there's something very special about what you just said because you're saying luck, but I think luck meets um, hustle. Yeah, if I'm you're not grinding, you're not putting in that work. Luck don't happen. That's and I'm a firm believer that if you doing something, it's nothing that can tell me different that you gonna find what you looking for. I believe that. Okay. Because I went riding that day, and that man was the owner not only of that house, but several in the neighborhood. I got the contract right then there on the hood of my car, and I flipped that contract so fast. I made $34,000 that day. <laughs> okay. Different type of hustle. Yeah, just from driving around in my car. Another time... I'm just walking in my neighborhood. I like to go for walks in the morning just to keep my mind in the, you know, sure. I like to get up and go for a walk in the morning. That's something I really, really enjoy doing. So this day I'm walking through my neighborhood. Um, my, my subdivision is fairly new. You know, it's going on maybe like three years old. So they were still building homes in my subdivision even after ours was built. So this house that I would walk by and see every day while I go walking, you know, watching the progress, seeing it get built. You know, you go in there and look and all of that stuff. Of course you're going in there. Of course. You know, so one day I walk by it and I see this man in the driveway and and getting out of his car. So I'm, hey, welcome to the neighborhood. <laughs> The friendly neighbor. Yeah, I'm thinking it's my friendly neighbor. I was like, oh, you bought this? You know, you. he's like, yeah, I bought this. But he wasn't buying it to move in. He's flipping. No, he bought it to put a tenant in it. He was an investor. Okay? He was a big investor. He was like, no, I'm buying, I'm buying this. Um, you know, we're going to rent it out, him and his partner. I was like, oh, really? I was like, how, is that what you do? Yeah, me and my partner, so-and-so, so-and-so. I was like, oh, that's what I do. I find off-market deals. I wholesale. He's like, oh, he's always looking for wholesale property. Ding, 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 ding. He was a hedge fund buyer. I could only imagine the yes that I know. when you. Yo, <laughs> Beethoven. <laughs> Nobody can not tell me God's hand is not on me and on my life. I believe that. I know that it is. Okay. I'm just minding my business walking. Why I went walking that day, and he had to be there at that moment where I was walking at that part of the subdivision. It's only right. But let me tell you how, how I played myself, how I let the enemy play me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Soon as you start feeling yourself a little bit, don't think that enemy ain't there lurking. You know, I still got the piece of paper where the man wrote it on his yellow script pad, his name, phone number, and email. You know how long the paper sat on my desk before I made the phone call? Slipping. Yeah, I, Yo, I couldn't believe it. I, you I, got too comfortable. I couldn't believe it. It took me, I tell my business partner this story too, it took me about a week 
or so before I even got the nerve. Because he gave me the number to call the partner because the partner was the one to, you know, to call, to talk, to do the mm-hmm. talking with. But I seen and met him. He gave you the partner. And he was white. Mm, you create all type of nonsense in your head. All type of nonsense in my head. Call the man. Was it the intimidation? The, man, the partner is black. The partner bought a deal from me like within the next week. I mean, it was easy as one, two, three. When I say easy, when I say I ain't never even met the partner face to face to this day. Speaker, speaker, I want you to talk about that because I know so many people that go through this process. So this whole identity of was it fear of the white man doing business with him? Was it I was afraid of the rejection. I was afraid of the rejection, thinking I wouldn't know what to say, how to have the conversation with them. Like He just wants a deal. And all he wanted was a deal, and I got him a deal. I got him a deal. How? Like, I, like we Facebook friends right now. <laughs> right, right now. Now, now. Now he's your close friend. Yes. So the fear... Fear and you know the the always feeling less than mm. you know coming from nothing, not thinking you deserve, you know. So it's crazy because it's like part of me inside is like I know I'm destined for greatness. You know what I'm saying? Like it's I believe that, but don't you can I can't sit here and tell you that I still don't doubt myself sometimes. Customer. Mm-hmm. How do you overcome it now? Do it scared. Talk your shit. (laughs) Talk your shit. Do it scared. Like, I'm scared right now, but I'm here and I'm doing it. I'm doing it. So I want to let everybody know this because this is so (laughs) dope. So Yaz, me and Yaz were talking and she's like, you know, Beethoven, I need to get on this show. I'm like, say less. Yaz booked her flight same day and was like, I'll be here next week. So the reason I love and I'm so inspired at, by that because you take control over your life and you you want something and you go and figure it out by all means necessary. That's a true statement. And I think that is so unique and that's why I'm I'm I was definitely open to finding a way to whatever I got to do to adjust my schedule. I'm going to find a way to make sure I hold you down on that because I know what it takes. I appreciate that. I appreciate the real people in my life. I really Absolutely. do. Like, Absolutely. Because this shit have you going crazy for real with the wrong people around you. It's the, I mean, I think that's the that's the pros and cons of business. You're going to. Yes. You know, I've dealt with so many people in business, um, you know, ups, I mean, that's, that, I think that's normal. I think you have you have to accept the game. But no, I've dealt with and accepted some things that I, yeah, I yeah, could yeah, never yeah, even wait, imagine. Yeah, well, yeah, um, yeah. Let, me, let me not compare your experience to everybody yeah. else's. Yeah. You know, you've, you have you I'm have talking a about a contractor <laughs> run off with $75,000 of the money. It's a little different. That's a little different. That's a little different. And the house still look exactly the same. And uh, 75000 uh, just gone, spent. So it was a lot. I had to go through to, to to get the processes and systems that I have now. Like I have amazing. You pay team. for a lot of yeah. Education. I have amazing team now. Let me give credit to my team. Shout out to my team. Like the people I work with now, my contractors, you know, other colleagues and other wholesalers that I work with, other investors. I wouldn't change nothing. What it took to get to to these people, you Absolutely. know. I mean. My client from Central Florida called me yesterday like, yes, this is the quickest flip I ever did. He's like, and this is his third house he's buying from me, okay? And he's telling me this one is the quickest flip he ever had. That's how bomb the team is I got down. I'm like, yo, tell them to slow down. <laughs> they, gotta execute. they moving that fast. He's like, soon as they finish, as I'm going to need two more. I, you know, I got you. Say less. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to the wrong person. I you got I, I got it from here. Right. 
right, I got you. So, mm-hmm. you know, my team now, they're they're efficient. You know what I'm saying? Um, they do everything by the book. You know, ain't no, you know, bootleg contractors and things like that. That shit is dead, you know? I, I think there's so many amazing things behind your story because I think there's so many people, not just ladies, so many people that's going, that's been through or going through your experiences Mm -hmm. and they're so lost. And for you to find something that is so lucrative and is, and is an asset. Yeah. I think your program, um, just doing business with you or learning how to do the business with you is such an important piece because people like you to have true testimony to tell people like listen do it while you scared i'm telling you that is so yeah. much game and value you're bringing into the industry of real estate but people that just want more out of life man and and i and i believe you're a game changer like, thank you nah real life because your testimony is so real and it's so painful like you talking about yeah you have you have 10 years over your head you know yeah. you had life like and you have you dealt with so much trauma from the beginning yes and for you to get to the position that you are now that's so that you're a champion yeah and i think I, and i believe they counted me out a long time ago and that don't even matter because i know so many people <laughs> out there that's watching this they counted them out a long time ago yeah but i think the triumph and who you are like i, I think very a lot of people don't realize that you have to be a champion to win Mm-hmm. Meaning what I mean by that, the champion mentality is always know you're going to win. It's always know there's always better. There's always, you're always fighting for more. That's a champion always. mentality. And I think yeah. you have that. And I think there's so many people that's just afraid of contacting that person that they're intimidated by. Mm-hmm. But when you did it while you scared, you was able to win right after you made that move. Yep. So making that move is so important. And very few people understand that. It's so important. You have to make the move because God wouldn't have put you in that place or put that in your spirit if it wasn't for you to do something with it. You know what I'm saying? Just like he told me to go for a walk that day at that time, you know. It's obedient. A, it's Yeah, being obedient, being intentional. It's a, it's a reason for everything. It's a reason why you have those feelings. Those feelings should make you want to do it even more, mm. you know, and that's where I am now. If, if I don't care if I'm scared. What? Do it. You said you good when you want to come. What did you I do? Said, I hung up the phone and I'm started looking for flights flight. because I, I understand and, and know now what time and means. Okay. And how valuable and important time is it is the most valuable equity or currency we we can't get back so it was time for me to make a move it was time i'm tired of waiting no one's gonna come and hand it to me and say okay yes come be on this come do this to scale your business come do this to scale your brand no one's gonna come and do that and say that to you for you you gotta get up and do something and make those moves and scale it yourself Okay, you may, of course, use things like a podcast or hire people, whatever, to help you. But still, you yourself have to make the move and make the decision. Absolutely. You know, and and that's where I'm at now. It's like you get backed into a wall, you know. Once you're so far back into that wall, it's only one way to go. Forward. So go for it, you know. And that's what I'm living by now from... From back then on, it's like I can't accept less anymore. I think you you took your trauma and made your trauma part of your success. Definitely. I'm Instead tired of, sitting of in playing it. small because of, you know, those feelings of what I was or what I've been through. You know, I, I, I'm not my past failures. You know, I'm not her. So for me... It's straight ahead. It's focus, laser focus. I don't care who don't like it, who ain't with it, who I offend. I don't care. I'm in a very dangerous place right now. My mindset right now, listen. Hmm. Talk your talk. It's, it's dangerous. Whoever fall off on the way, they just going to fall off. 
is because they can't play in that in that realm in that field. You know, let them, yeah, just let them go. You know, catch up with me later. So I want to add because I think what I want to do. I'm inspired by you. I'm inspired by how you move. Um, and I have a couple things planned out for doing events. Oh, okay. So what I want to do is I actually want to host. Um, I have an event that we're planning. My team and I. Um, it's called the shift. And what the shift is basically an event where you, you know, entrepreneurs like yourself, people that's educating people to build with the, whatever. I want you guys to talk about the shift, how it happened, because there's so many people that speak with me daily and want to know more about how to enhance, how to get to another level, the mindset shift, all these different things. And I think people like yourself, I think there's several people I know that want to get into the real estate business, but I know several people with felonies also that can't get their real estate license. So I think you're being able to educate them on how to get into real estate and still build asset. Absolutely. Through hustling, man. Right. I, I think hustling is an action that I think never stop. Right. I think at the moment you stop hustling, you stop. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, I, I don't want to say nothing mean. The moment you stop hustling. Yeah, it's over for you. You know. Yeah. You said it. I didn't say it. Um, but. <laughs> I truly think what I want to do is plan. I want to invite you back here um, and host this event and and be part of this event. And I think you have, I think you should add on to that. I don't know if you're doing it now because I know you have an ebook that, um, like I said, what, I want the link so we can add it into our website and hopefully you could give some type of discount to our viewers. Absolutely. You know, um, that could, like, I, just some, I, I think you, you you are impacting already, but I definitely believe you're you're gonna go to a whole different level. Like I you, believe you, you got it. you got the juice, and <laughs> and and the juice is the consistency, the commitment, not giving up. Like I think you're gonna teach so many people that in your space that I don't know, man. You, Let you, me just say this: I want to add this too because. Even before I got all the way in, both feet in, into real estate, I still attempted to finish to finish college because I was brainwashed, just like so many other Americans. You know, they drill that in us at such a young age. They don't teach us about investing in school. All they teach us to go, go to, to school. school and get a good job. So, you know, even before I got into all of this, I still attempted to go back to school and finish my degree. Okay. Congratulations. And I did it. I did. I went back to school and I got my degree. Did you do that for yourself or your mother? <sighs> I I think I did it for both of us. One, for her. And then two, for me, because... I needed income, consistent income, and a good income. And they, they told me if I went to school and finished and got this degree, I would get a job making $65,000 a year. That was a starting salary. That excited me at the time. You know, at that time, $65,000 a year excited me. Right now, $65,000 a month excites me, okay? So... Long story short, I went back to school and finished my degree. The day I graduated, the day I walked across the stage and got my diploma is the day after I found out that I was pregnant with my daughter. Congratulations. <laughs> Literally. That's why I said it's so much more. Like that was another major, major turning point in my life because here I am thinking I'm doing the right thing again. Okay. And now I'm pregnant. So, you know, the internships I had lined up that I was going to get on and get, a, get on it with a job with them at the practice and all of that, all that was out the window now. Like, it was an awful pregnancy. I was sick. I mean, <laughs> like I was, oh my God. Like, it was not good. I am not strong when it comes to that. That's not your thing. That ain't huh? my thing. Right. Like, oh my God. So I need it now. A job. I'm like, now, now what? Okay. So what do I do? I 
I got to get a job. So I go in the papers. I look online. They're hiring at this place. My old supervisor, she's my friend on Facebook, too. <laughs> she know the story now. I interviewed with her. She didn't even know I was pregnant in the interview. I went to Walmart, bought me a big old size 12 blazer, oh, pants, everything. I'm like, I got to go get a job. Like, I, I'm going to have to go get a job. Like, I can't believe this. I got to go get a job. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I go do the interview or whatever. I'm sitting in the waiting room, Beethoven, to go back for the interview. All I feel is just, I oh, promise no. you. <laughs> oh. I go to the bathroom. Like, what is this? Like, oh my God, you I cannot believe I'm in this place about to go into labor at this job. And the people didn't even know I was pregnant. I had to hide the pregnancy. They wasn't gonna hire me. I go to the bathroom, y'all. This is a little graphic, so. <laughs> but it wasn't. I wasn't in labor, but it was the mucus plug. If you know what that is. I don't, but I don't know. I didn't know. know either at the time. Yeah, but but it's, you don't gotta tell it's me. something that happens. People could just Google it. Google it. Yes. So the mucus plug came out, y'all. I'm but assuming I, that's not good. No, because that means you're real close. You're going to deliver soon. Right. Okay? I got through the interview. <laughs> And me and this lady, when I hold say on, we on, mad on, cool on, today, my on. supervisor. <laughs> well, yes, you had um, you had the mucus plug come out. <laughs> the mucus plug came out at the interview. And you went and just finished your interview. And I went and just finished the interview, cause I needed you a, a whole job. Different level. Listen, I needed a job. I can't. Yo, if I ain't got no money, you do not want to be around me if I don't have no money. <laughs> you had to figure it out. Yeah, I had to figure it out. You know, so here I am. Pregnant on my own, you know. How to figure it out. Man, abandoned, broken, lost. So I go, I get the job. Okay. <laughs> so before I finally got that job, that was a phlebotomist job that I got. Before that, shoot, I was working at Walmart. Hustling. Yeah, hustling. I'm talking making $7 and change an hour, okay? $7 and change an hour working at Walmart. So why your pride never got in the way? Because I had to survive. <laughs> I had no one. Who else is going to do it? So, I mean, yo, even the, my daughter's father even laughed at me like, you work at Walmart. Yeah. Like, I went through it. That was another major turning point in my life. Like, it was not a good time. But again, God pushed me through, as he always does. So I got that job, you know. But again, it was a part-time gig. So it's like 24 hours a week. How do you survive? So on 24 hours a week, I was eligible for food stamps and child care. So I was getting food stamps, WIC, and child care. And you figured it out. I actually lived that life for some time, for some years. Okay. So I think that's one thing I'm like I said, I'm so inspired by you because you went through all this all stuff that and still found a way to build. That's that's special. Cause I knew that wasn't that wasn't it for me. And I, I wasn't satisfied, you know. I was not satisfied with that. And now I'm about to be a mother. I was like, oh, hell no. I cannot be living like this. And now I have this child. All I could think about is what I didn't have as a child and what I want to be as a parent. You so know? you were inspired of being a different mother. What? My daughter lives a very good life. Trust me. Okay. Very I see, good. I see her often. <laughs> I see her on boats. I see her. She, My daughter have been to Dubai, life. Mexico. Like, she rolls out with us. Yeah. You know? So. Like, why was that so important for you to, to do because, that? Because, you know, despite of everything, you know, I'm still my mother's child. And I love my mother deeply and dearly, you know. Um, and I want to have the same kind of relationship with my daughter, but better. You know, I want to be a better mother to her you know and i i really had to get it together what does legacy look like for you 
Legacy for me looks like making sure that not not that I'm only okay, but when I'm no longer here, that my daughter is okay too. You know, right now I'm I'm working and building not for yes to Yaz, not for Yasma. I'm building right now for my last name, not my first name, for Anderson. So Kennedy can leave, live that legacy on when I'm no longer here. And I'm happy with that, you know. Would you want her to get into the business? I can definitely see her as an entrepreneur. You know, she tells me now, you know, mommy, I want to sell houses like you. I want to sell houses like that's all she keeps saying. But when I tell her, come on, Kenny, we got to go ride to this so property. I, she so don't want to go. Right, so ah, <laughs> mommy, I don't want, we got to ride. <laughs> yeah, we have to ride to another, to see another property today, Kennedy. But um, she's my everything. And um, when I had her, she was born in 2013. And then I started the business, I told you, in 2015 is when I started the second business. And then February 2016, I lost my nephew to gun violence. My oldest sister's first child, her son, um, back home in Connecticut. When that happened, when I lost my nephew, because he, he and I were very, very close. We had so many plans. You know, I was just, you know, coming out of my postpartum depressions, you know, coming back into my mojo, if you will, you know. And Yaz has, has mojo. <laughs> he was doing his thing, you know, getting money and stuff. And we were just getting ready to collaborate and do, you know, real estate. And and just like that, just like that, he lost his life. Um, and I miss him a lot. But I will say once that happened, you know, it really, really did something to our family. You know, a death mm. really, like it can make or break a family. Sometimes it brings families together, but in most cases it brings families apart. And when we lost him, he was the first grandson. You know, he was the man like of the family, you know? So it, it put a real, real bad, bad damper on our family. But for me, it did something for me, just the opposite. Like when I say I turned up. I started the business July 17th, okay? When I say by, like, I don't know, that next year, I just started taking things more serious, you know, just the thought of loss, you know, when you losing a family member or someone so close to you, I was like, you know, it, it's time for me to start taking my life and everything I do more seriously, and, and that's what I did. I think for me, before we leave, I, I want you to, because I think I always got to give shout out to men. Mm -hmm. You know, we are so amazing. <laughs> Just want to be clear. Um, great guys out there. I want you, because I want to give you, I want you to let people know how great your husband is. I'm getting to that. Yeah, I just want to be clear. Yeah, just so sure. let me get, so yeah, after all of that I went through, okay. The great guy. I can help the you out. The great guy. Like, I mean, <laughs> stepping up. Let me just let me just take you and give you a visual, okay? I'm talking single mother working um at the health department in the lab, drawing blood. I was probably making, I don't know, $16 an hour or something. Had child care. Um, you know, I was getting off work, just going to pick my baby up. You know, just doing what I needed to do. Like, this is what I'm in now, Lord. You know, I got out of, you know, that situation. I accept it. Okay. It's me and my baby. You know, this is not how I planned it. Um, I had her very late in life, by the way. Mm -hmm. I didn't have Kennedy till I was 38. I had my first and only child. Wow. Because I, I had this thing on me that I wasn't going to do it unless it was right. Like, I... I wanted it to be right. I wanted it to be different from what I grew up and was used to. And I still didn't get it right. <laughs> I wasn't trying to laugh at that yet. I still, Gosh, I couldn't I hold still it still didn't get it right. So, you know, I'm going taking my baby to the, to the sitter, picking her up, going to work and picking her up, just going through life. Like, Lord, this is it. You know, this was probably... 
another bad time, you know, one of the worst times for me in my life because I'm I'm just getting by with barely nothing. You know what I'm surviving. saying? Yeah, I'm just I'm just surviving. And um one day I'm picking her up from the sitter. And this guy, he just <laughs> This is this is getting good. Yeah, he, this guy, he just he asking the other people there, who am I? Who's that lady? Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? You know, I, although I had a little part time gig and I was getting wicked, we, I still was whatever. fly. We, we know you were. I still was in school. my own Lexus, had okay. my own home. Right, let's right. let's you know, let's just keep it one hundred here. You know, right. he's still looking and checking for me. Like, okay, she got you, a little, you didn't miss nothing. Yeah, she got a little something going on. <laughs> Could you go back to how great he is? How we get back so, to you? They was like introducing me to him, and I'm like, yeah, hey. I'm like, okay, and I get in my car and I pulls off and keep it pushing. This happened for about a week or more. Like he would see me, smart man, picking my keep picking my daughter up. He just kept trying. <laughs> when you gonna give me? When you gonna give me your phone number? When you gonna give me your phone number? That's how you said it. It wasn't. It wasn't normal. It was. My husband, number. first of all, he's from Alabama, so yeah. yeah he's like, it was a little different. It was different. And I, I looked him dead in his face and I said, you ain't ready for this. <laughs> he probably wasn't. Yeah. I just want to help that brother out also. I was like, you ain't ready for this. Like, I was giving him no time of day. Like, literally no time of day. Man, he was over there one day. I was trying to thank you. I was picking the baby up. He caught me on one of them days. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> He caught me on one of those days. I gave him my phone number, or whatever. Well, you at that point, you like, man, all right, you got me. I'm like, okay. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And the lady that used to keep my daughter, she would tell me, because I worked part time from like 11 to 2 or 11 to right. 3 or something like that. You know, she would be like, yes. You know, you don't got to come get her right right when you get off. Like, they pay for her to be here so you can go home for a little bit. Little little, bit. And then, nah, B, I'm coming to get my baby. Me and my bed. baby, we going home. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because this is what I'm on. Like I, By now, I ain't got time for no games. Leave me alone. Okay, I'm a single mama by myself with this baby. Got to make shit work the best way I know how. Leave me alone. Right? You don't want no game. I ain't had no time. Long story short, I give him the phone number. Got him. He got me. He calling me, calling me. Next thing I know, he want to take me out. You, you <laughs> so <laughs> Boy, you women, boy, you felt like it was a bad thing. Like, he want to take like, me oh, out. Oh, he want to take me out. No you want to go to dinner. Yeah, so I'm like, but mind you, I had just had a baby. Kennedy's like a toddler at this time. Oh, okay. You know, I ain't been like with nobody since the whole, you know, I'm like, I got a whole bad vibe. Your whole, with your this whole thing. mind, like, yeah. Yeah, like, I ain't got time for that. That right there keeps me off my game. Like, leave me alone, you know? So I gave him a chance. I gave him a chance, and I am so glad I did. Like, real talk. I'm tell so you grateful. How great guys are great. Yeah, they like, got I got a good man. I ain't, I'm not going to sit here in front. I'm not going to sit here and lie. Like, I ain't never had a good man until now in my life. Like, every man I ever had treated me like shit, you know. But, but he stepped up. He, yes, he stepped up. He's, like, he ain't nothing like nothing I ever dated before, you know. And he stepped up, and he became that role model, you mm. know, in our house. And here we are now, nine years later. That's beautiful. I think the sub so him the support in the business the support in the house. What support? He definitely is all for me going after what I want for this business. You know, he's like, sure. "That's what you want to do. Go ahead. You know, do that." Um, you know, I just want to make sure that you gave. You know, because I know how important great guys are to the world, and yeah, I mean, you're a good guy too. The greatest, yeah, you're you're a good guy. I like just you're sure a really on, good guy. Definitely just keep making great guys. You know how we yeah. just come together. Just want to make sure. You're <laughs> shout out. No, but yeah, um, but I wouldn't change. I wouldn't change. You know, you know, change it for the world. Like he's he's beyond great. He's a great role model and father to my daughter, our daughter. 
He's very um, hardworking, God, God fearing. He's faithful. That's important. Um, you know, we don't have those infidelity situations going on and black arguments. Men don't cheat. And yeah, black men don't cheat. We don't go mm, through that. Right. Just want to very sure. considerate. He's not abusive physically, emotionally, and none of that. These are things you've been waiting for, praying for. I didn't think they existed, and they actually mm. do. They actually do. And I will say this. It was hard for me, you know, because being someone like myself, coming from all the things I've been through, and to have to have a man now, what we, 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 what we can say is a man, that's different. That's different. It's really different. So it was definitely an adjustment for me. Um, and me it takes some getting used to because he literally caters to me and Kennedy. He literally is doing everything every day for our best interests. You know, powerful. it's very powerful. So I'm very grateful and very thankful for him and to have the support because to do this and to do what we're doing and to not have a supportive partner. That unit is important. Ooh. Ooh. Definitely. It's, yeah, yeah. So if you had to, you know, while we wrapping up, if you had to give anyone or a group of people any game on progressing and going to another level, what would that secret or that game be? And it might not just be one I mean, thing. Yeah, it's it, it's not just one thing. It's definitely what, what we said earlier, doing it scared, you know. And you have to... um get around the right people. And I keep saying that and it sounds so cliche and I've been hearing it and hearing it, but it's very, very true. Like right now I'm around the right people. I'm sitting here right now at Hustler's Testimony doing this podcast. Okay. So you have to get in the rooms. You have to get out and, and network with other people, rub shoulders with other people in those rooms where you want to be and where you see yourself. You understand what I'm saying? You can't just sit at home and look at them and scroll and look at everybody else online doing it. You got to get out there, you know what I'm saying, and make those connections and stuff so that you can progress as well. You know, that that is the number one advice I would give a person. And if you already see something isn't working, you know, um, if it's your job that you're doing and you're working it and you just trying to keep working that job harder and harder and harder and you already see it's not working, it's time for you to work harder at something else. You know, try something else. OK, that's the best advice I would give to any person, because that's how you find your way. How, how else would you find your way if you don't get out there and start getting on the journey? Absolutely. Absolutely. Need you to leave your information with people. Absolutely. In Absolutely. Y'all can follow me on Instagram at yes to yes. That's Y E S T O dot Y A S at Y E S T O dot Y A S. And on um, Facebook, I am yes to yes as my first name, last name Anderson. And if you want to get in touch with me and talk to me about how to get into the real estate investing business, go to www.profitfromproperty.biz. www.profitfromproperty.biz. And we'll put a link under the website. And don't forget, you guys, you're going to give us a discount Definitely. on your program. Yeah, the 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 program for the ebooks are $47. But anyone that that's gets big it, game. That's, that's I'm gonna give them to your um your audience for twenty seven dollars. I'm gonna take twenty dollars off. <laughs> I'm gonna take twenty dollars off. And like I said in that book, I give you guys the actual tools and resources that I use um in my real estate business today. So it's a good place to start if you're not really ready for like one to one coaching and you're ready to get into a deal. Go ahead and start with my ebook series, Profit from Property. And they also, after they get that ebook, they also can start investing with you. Absolutely. And they go through the whole process with you. Yes, they can. I'm excited. And I can't wait till you come back here and do this event. <laughs> this was fun. It's gonna be dope. I'm proud of you. Keep doing dope thing, guys. If I'm going to the mic. God, you so lame. Peace. <laughs> Peace out, y'all. <laughs> <laughs>